Okay, let's get this started. Hello everyone and welcome to the last WSSS meeting of the year. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we're going to have our guest, uh, Andre Galante. He's uh, a developer and a designer from Argentina with over 15 years of experience. He's part of the Red Hat user experience team and is part of the core team of, uh, that's maintaining and developing Bootstrap. So he knows his stuff. And he's going to talk today about uh, principles of architecture of CSS. So let's put this on and let's get started. Ahmed, we're ready oh, for you. Yeah, let me share my screen for mm. This one. Okay, well, we can see. Do you guys see it? Yeah. yeah. So if you put it on full screen, we'll be able to. Okay, so yeah. Give us a few words about you first and then let's get started. We're all listening to you. Right, so I, I guess you did a brief introduction. I'm going to make a few uh, an introduction later on in the presentation, so I can just get started if, if you're okay with that. Go ahead. We're all ears. All right, sure. So, hello, guys. Thank you very much for, for inviting me and having me with you on this meetup. I'm extremely happy to be talking to you guys today, not only because you're a group of CSSers and I just feel at home with people that love what I do. I just love Irish people. I've been there last year for a team meetup and it was one of the best trips of my life. Uh, I think that you guys have this ironic and sarcastic sense of humor that is just unbeatable. So today I will be talking about what I think is the biggest challenge we face as CSS developers in CSS. Because CSS is like a bear cub, it's cute and inoffensive, but when it grows, it will eat you alive. And here is a fact, your code base will never get smaller. They start as beautiful and pristine code bases, but then we start adding more code, and then more hands get into that, and it becomes this specificity nightmare. Have a deadline to meet, we add an important here and there. And it becomes this monster, which is so painful to work on that it can, can happen in your life. But actually, I Googled that, and it seems that the worst thing that can happen in your life is related to Justin Bieber almost always. But disregarding of that, uh, we know that thing, right? A really bad goal base is just so painful to, to work with. So I read this tweet by Una Kravitz. She's asking, what advice would you give to the subject of future proofing your code? And Harry Roberts' answer was, make, delete. Not extend, not improve, delete. And that would be great, right? It would be great if we can delete code, but this is really hard. But Ben Frame wrote a book called Enduring CSS. And during this book, he gives amazing insights on how to architecture CSS by isolating components. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this later on. But if you haven't read this book yet, it's free to read online, and I'm leaving a reference here on the slides. Now, today, I will be presenting about the three pillars that me and my team follow to create the next version of Patternfly, which is our open source design system that we created at Red Hat to have consistency across our different UIs, products, and projects. A brief introduction before I continue. My name is Andres. Uh, I'm, as Adrian mentioned, from Buenos Aires in Argentina. I'm a designer and a CSS developer. And this means that you guys will have the pleasure to listen to my Argentinian accent for the next half an hour. I work at Red Hat. I'm part of the, the team doing Butterfly. I'm leading the CSS efforts there. Wrote a few articles for CSS tricks, and I'm also a core team member of the Bootstrap project. I know that every opinion on any project uh, can be dangerous to make. So 
I guess I'm going to, to show today what is working for us and what is a solution that is actually solving our problems. But I am truly, I'm a true believer that there is no true way a solution is as good as the problem you are trying to solve. So even though there are many solutions for different pro problems to you, and I'm going to share what is working for us and what I think is really important to follow. So let's start with the question, why? Why are we even talking about CSS architectures? A maintainable CSS setup is critical to create responsive, accessible, and performant UIs. And we know this, right? This is the, the world we live in. We have different devices with different screen sizes, different capabilities, different browsers. And the web is even in places that there are no screens at all, like an Amazon Echo, a Google Home, or even a car or, or a refrigerator. Our, our content is going to land. Is it going to be on a tidy device with like a stylus or a huge TV that has touch capabilities? And on top of that, we need to think about users. Devices come in all sizes, shapes, and capabilities too. And we need to take accessibility into consideration. And let me tell you a story. Right here at the top of the human pile is my second son, Federico. And when Federico was born, that his hearing test gave a negative result, meaning that he might have hearing problems. And as I was sitting in the hospital with little Federico in my arms, I promised myself that I would do my absolute best to ensure that everything I produce is accessible. One year old, we test him again, and this time the results came positive. So thank God he's okay. But since then, everything my team or I produce has accessibility baked in. And if you think about it, we spend a lot of time thinking about an Internet Explorer, and we have way more disability people than Internet Explorer users. If you take color blindness alone, it makes almost 9% of adult Caucasian males. I9 and I10, they are almost less than 1%. Even if you take I11, is 3.5%. And to give that a, a balance of disabled people in the US is almost as large as the whole population of Argentina. The web is accessible by default. And if your website is not accessible, it's your fault and you should fix it. Now, we also need to think about performance. We only have a few seconds of user's attention. In fact, according to the National Center of Biotechnology Information, the average attention span of a human being from 12 seconds in the year 2000 to eight seconds in the year 2015. And that's one second less than the attention span of a goldfish. Goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds, which is one second more than any of us. So treat the web as if it was a liquid cat. It should be fast and fluid, accessible and performant. And we can actually support this reality by creating maintainable CSS architectures. And I will go through three fundamental concepts that will explain how. Now, within Red Hat, I work with a lot of Java developers, and some of them are among the best Java developers in the world. And I learned from them that the way you would architecture a Java application is by following the feature API implementation model. For a feature you want to implement, you create an interface in the middle, which is the API, and then, um, and then, this, and then your implementation will communicate through this layer of abstraction. Now, as long as your API is excellent, the implementation is kind of secondary. You can always refactor it without generating breaking changes. And we have a very similar structure. We have our content, which is the feature we want to implement. We have the DOM API, that is all our HTML elements and classes for CSS implementation. Now, if a UI component delivers 
a feature, but a bad API and a bad implementation, you might be achieving some business goals and meeting really tight deadlines. And sometimes that's what matters to keep a project alive. Also be generating technical depth. And if you don't have to make things right now, when are you going to have time to fix them, right? Now, if you can deliver your UI component with an excellent API, but a bad implementation, a house that has an excellent structure, but a terrible paint job, you can always repaint it without remodeling or changing the structure. The way you write HTML should be the same, right? It should be a really, really good structure. It should be semantic. It should have correct accessibility roles and area tags, and it should follow a good naming convention. A perfect UI structure is resilient and robust. It would have amazing content, a perfect and semantic accessible HTML, modular and flexible CSS. And let me show you an example of that. And to give you an example, I'm going to build this card. And this card has a header and a body. Within the header, it has a title on the left and, some, uh, and a navigation on the right. Now, this is an exercise we usually give to candidates when they want to join my team at Red Hat, the, the errors and the things we see every day. So I'm going to go through these three scenarios I just mentioned about. And everything I'm going to do are things that I, I, we actually do see every day, even though they seem like silly mistakes. We'll use the first one first. And uh, so here. So let's try to make first a good feature with a bad API and a bad implementation. So let's create this card. This card we have inside um, the header and the body. Sorry. Here we're going to have a title uh, and a few anchors. And let's make this like four anchors. Email, it has, oh no, I forgot here, we have some text. So here is the feature, right? I'm having the feature done. The content is there and it's looking as it should. The AI, the HTML is horrible. It's not semantic, it's not accessible. It doesn't have a correct naming convention. It's really bad too. I'm using the transform and position hack in order to, to center the element in the middle of the, of the screen vertically. And of course, if I add more content here, I will see how the header goes away from the screen, even if, even if I scroll, and then I can see the bottom part of the card. Now, uh, the other problem here is that I'm floating the name to the left here, and I'm floating the anchors to the right. And this creates the layout. But as soon as I start adding more text here, it will break if I, if I add more text to the item too. And of course, since I'm floating this to the right, then the order of the items. So if I add some numbers here, I will see how they are changed the order. Now, this is a bad implementation and a bad API, but I am actually delivering the feature. So this might be OK. But let's look at how we can build this with a good API, good HTML elements with a good naming convention. So card, this card has the header, the title, and the body. And you can see that I'm using BEM naming convention for this. And I think it's the best way to do it. You can use other naming conventions, but at least it's a very robust naming convention to follow. Navigation is another component, uh, and this component also have its own scope name. It's also, it also has have roles and accessibility area tags. It's still horrible. It's still doing the same thing as before. So if I add more decks anyway, anywhere, it will break in all sorts of ugly ways. Uh, but at least having this really good structure, it allows me to create new implementations without actually changing the HTML. And now let's look at how everything would work together. So in this case, I have a really good feature. The feature is there. The API is here. I'm having the exact same HTML I built before. 
Uh, and on the implementation, I'm going to use flex to flex the header. So on the header itself, I'm going to flex it and do justify content space between to make the first element at the beginning and the last, the last element at the end. Then I'm going to center the title on the center of vertically center the title on the container. Navigation, I'm going to stretch the container, stretch the items, and then center the links. Fast implementation, because if I add text anywhere, it will just stretch. So if I add text here on the title, it stretches, it centers the title. And if you see all the area of the links are clickable, which is something that a few years ago, it would have been almost inimaginable to, to build without a bit of, of JavaScript, right? I love flex, flex post for that. Uh, or if I add more text in any of the items, you will also stretch uh, and it will never break. So this is a very good way to implement implement CSS. I mean, a, a feature which has good API and good CSS implementation. Now, maybe on some projects, you can get away with just delivering a good feature, knowing that you're leaving technical depth behind. Building a design system or a dependency, the most important part is the API. The API is the rock where everything else should be built upon, so it should be really, really strong. Now, the feature API implementation model shows the importance of writing rock-solid HTML, and it's ironic that today that is a blue beanie day, uh, we are talking about web standards and, and the, the importance of, of HTML, right? But I guess it comes down to, to this call by Yoda, do or do not, there is no try, especially with HTML, so take your time. But a good DOM API is not enough to create a successful CSS architecture. We also need component isolation. And this takes me to the second pillar. What we find while, while maintaining CSS is due to isolation problems. And scoping CSS has been a very trendy topic for the past few years with BAM, CSS modules, CSS in JavaScript, and web components with shadow DOM. That especially has been a really, really good debate on, on isolation. And there is a great article uh, on this subject by Monica Lintilescu, and I'm going to leave here a reference in case you want to check it out later. But I guess Regardless of the implementation you follow, the concept continues to be the same. To have CSS sanity, you need isolation. Let each thing be a thing and not an extension of anything else. This rise or of uh, design systems or, or platforms or frameworks where they are utility first, like Atomic CSS and Tailwind, but I think they all suffer from, from these problems of dependency. Uh, if you extend CSS instead of isolating it, you end up with this network of dependencies where the system is like this Jenga spider waves thing that if you move any block, the whole system will just collapse. Example of that. Let's go back to this card. And in this case, there is here a secondary navigation within the content, within the body. To build that, I can extend the first navigation, right? It's almost the same. It will be an, an alt version of this navigation. So I can reproduce this here and then add a modifier class, which is alt. So this is an alternative version of the navigation. I'm extending one with the other. And on the CSS, I'm changing uh, some things just to extend the navigation, and it just works. But this is not really maintainable because the main navigation, for example, if I go to the main navigation and I change the link to have a padding to the top of, let's say, three M's, I will see that the second navigation will get impacted, it just explodes in itself. So I need to add more styles to the second navigation just to and do the change I did on the first navigation. And this is just a very, very small example, but once you get a system that is like that, you end up 
without the possibility to delete anything, because as soon as you delete something, everything else will just fall apart. Why it's so important to get isolation. But sometimes you want to extend the component and create modifiers. So the question is, when to create a new component? Now, on my team, the rule is that if it changes more than the scale or the color, then the thing is a new entity. So for example, if I take the navigation and I have different sizes like small, or if I change the color like primary color or secondary color, then I just create a modifier. If any other change, I just create a new instance of that component. BEM, a naming convention, I know you're probably uh, familiar with BEM, but the benefits of BEM are not just scope to, to scoping and readability. It also provides a really good base for testing. And it's really important to have a global namespace. So this uh, namespace, in our case, is a prefix for our classes, is PF for pattern fly and a dash. And we use that through all our systems. So whenever someone is implement, implementing our design system, then they can know which classes come from Pattonfly and which classes will be directly from their projects. Isolating components, then we find the problem of, of consistency. If you isolate components, then how do you keep components consistent with, it, with each other? And that's when we create a layer of common variables and mixings that we share across all the components. So this layer will define spaces for margins and paddings, shadows, colors, typography, borders, animation, C index, and sometimes more. Uh, but the idea is that each component will have its own scope variables, but those variables will call some other variable which is uh, common for the system. And let me show you exactly how, how that works. So here I have the same component. It has the main navigation here. Navigation is now a new component. It's called secondary navigation. And it's completely isolated from the other navigation. It's a new entity. Now, on the CSS, I have this layer of variables. They, in this case, is SAS, and I'm using SAS variables. But if you're brave enough and you don't care for all browsers, you can use CSS variables too. They're pretty awesome. Uh, and here I'm defining things like line height, borders, spacers, and a few colors. Just for the sake of this demonstration, I would have done more for, for a real code base. And for example, if I take here the secondary navigation, I'm defining the secondary nav link as the primary color. So I'm, I'm using it here. And then on here, I have this variable that is scoped to this element. Color class of the links to be, let's say, pink. I can make them pink here. But if I want to change everything that was primary to be pink on the whole system, I can change it here. So then these scope elements become an island. And I can just remove one or the other without worrying about changing anything else. The other super, super good benefit of having isolating components I can have the components that I write today with a component that I have that I write five years from now side by side, and it wouldn't matter because they are isolated. Every time you start a new component, you're starting from greenfield, the technologies that are available on CSS. Components is super important, right? How to create components. But at the end of the day, we need to make these components work within a page, within a layout, about separation of UI structure concerns. And a, use, a UI structure can be either a component or a layout. And we, we, also, we usually do this analogy with Lego blocks or brick walls, where each component stretches to the size of its container, and then the container yeah, and then the grid or the layout will regulate the placement and sizing, ignoring what happens inside. But of course, we have a better analogy, which is the liquid gas. So 
Layouts are containers. They are just concerned about the vertical and horizontal alignment and spacing of their children, but they just don't know what they have inside. Components are modular and independent structures concerned about how things look. So a component always touches the four sides of its container, and the component itself never has a width or a float. They are float elements. And of course, in the same tag, we never mix a layout with a component. We always define the layouts first, and then we put the components inside. Concepts looks obvious to us that we do this every day, but you wouldn't imagine how alien this concept is for people that are not CSS developers. Even Java developers or JavaScript developers get really confused with this. So, and that's why I guess this was born where they think that everything breaks with CSS, but it's mainly because the structure is wrong. And this is really important to create prefixes to class names. So a component will have a C and a dash before the class name, have an, an L with a, with a dash before a cla the class name. Now, you can also do that with utility links to have a utility classes with U and the dash. But this L and C is very important because when you write this, the HTML, you are sure or you make sure that no C class and L class get together on the same tag. Now, to generate an example of this, let's create this gallery of which is a layout, and then this layout will regulate the cards that we have be, been building inside. So let's first create the gallery. In this case, it's going to be called L-gallery. And within the gallery, oh, not really, not that. Yeah, there you go. And within this gallery, I'm going to add a few cards. So I have some snippets here already. It's the same card that, that I had before. And I'm going to add a bunch of them to create the gallery. So here I have, I don't know, like 10 cards inside. And this gallery, I'm going to use fancy grid to display it. So it's going to be display grid. Then I'm going to make this display grid gap to be spacer. So it's a, a so this is a um, variable that is scoped to this element, but it's calling a general vari variable for the whole system. Spacer is 1M, I think. And then the template is going to repeat and out of it using the min max function to do a min of 20 M's and a max of 1FR. This is that just by taking this wrapper, I accommodate any child that is inside. And I, I don't even have to write a viewport uh, viewport media queries because this is responsive. So if I change the size of this, I don't know why I can't change the size of this, but I'm going to show it later. Uh, if I change the size, then it actually changes. Uh, well, I'm going to show it in a bit, but what I want to show to you guys is that generate this as a list instead of, of a gallery. I can just change the, the layout class to be list and the list is changing the columns and it's making everything. So by changing the wrapper, I can change the layout. So the components, they don't know where they are, they just extend. And then the wrapper or the layout will define what it has inside. Now, I want to show to you this, that this is responsive. And uh, I read it, it's amazing. I just can't wait to, to have a little bit more support so, so we can actually use it. Today, we talk about uh, the importance of writing really, really good semantic HTML. Uh, we talk about isolating UI structures and separating UIs from components, sorry, UI layouts from UI components. And you will end up with the modular implementation, your entire team to create maintainable uh, structures and long lead projects that are responsive, performance, and accessible. I will post in some articles with a deeper dive on, into these subjects uh, and CSS maintainability. And if you want to follow through that, uh, follow me on Twitter. 
Plus, I would love uh, to get to know you guys better, bounce some ideas, get some feedback. And of course, if you ever come to Buenos Aires, are on me. So uh, I hope this was helpful for you guys and thank you very much for, for having me.